Welcome back to Physics 272. And there we are. All right, so last time we talked about these charge densities. Last time we talked about just a general charge density and how you would derive the field, the electric field, from any shape charge density. What we're teaching you is um, basically how to do that, how from any shape charge density you want to make up, you will now know how to calculate the electric field, at least in principle. Now, it's typically a difficult calculation. We're walking you through some simple examples, but the principle's always the same. So uh, to get the electric field of a charge distribution, we always look at the charge distribution itself and break it up into point charges or something simple that you already know. So we start from, from that. Typically, we start from point charges. And we know that the electric field coming off of a point charge falls off like 1 over r squared. And then we build up the charge density we're interested in. So last time, we did that for a charged rod. So the charge rod here. And then we saw that on the bisecting plane at a high symmetry, easy to calculate point, we saw that the electric field fell off like 1 over r close to the rod. And if the rod length went to infinity, it actually fell off like 1 over r everywhere in space. So a charged, an infinitely long charged rod has an electric field which falls off like 1 over r. OK, sound familiar from last week? OK, do you have any questions from last time? OK, all right. OK, so today we're going to extend that kind of idea into a couple of different geometries. So we'll look at the electric field coming off of a charged ring. OK, so just a ring of charge. And then extend that to a disk, a solid disk of charge. And then also look at an infinite plane and then two infinite planes. But we use exactly the same principles. It's the superposition principle, right? We know the electric field coming off of a point charge. We can now integrate over any shape we like and build up the electric field for sh complicated shapes like rings, disks, and infinite planes. So first, I want to guess, get a sense of where we're going, OK? So we have the point charge. We know that the electric field on a point charge falls off like 1 over r squared. Okay. For the line charge, for an infinite line charge, we saw that the electric field falls off like 1 over r. And it doesn't matter if you're up or down, right? An infinitely long line charge doesn't know about up or down. It's just distance from the rod. And it falls off like 1 over r. Can you kind of, based on that trend, can you make a guess as to what would happen if I did the infinite plane of charge or an infinite sheet charge? So it went 1 over r to the 2, 1 over r to the 1. What do you expect here in this trend? And then we'll calculate and see if our guess is right. It's just a guess. So what's a guess as to how it might go? Yeah? OK, so one of the options we could put there is maybe it's just independent of r. Maybe it just goes from 1 over r to the 2, 1 over r to the 1, to 1 over r to the 0, which is independent of r. Okay, So we'll just calculate and we'll see. And in fact, we're going to see that that intuition is actually right. But I think this is half the fun of physics, is thinking ahead of time before I do the long calculation. Let's see, what do we expect physically? Okay, So we have this prediction that, that a classmate just made of maybe this is constant. Let's calculate it and see if that's correct. Okay, We're actually going to show that that's the case. All right. First off, we're going to calculate the electric field of a ring. Okay, we're not going to do the plane yet. I'm going to do the ring, then we'll do the disk. Okay? From the disk, we'll take the disk such that its size goes to infinity. That's how we'll get the plane out of all this calculation. But we have to start uh, with uh, an easier case. So first, we'll start with a ring. And here, I want a ring of charge of radius A. I'm going to orient the ring in the xy plane. And then I'm going to look at a high symmetry point. I'm going to look at the electric field along the z-axis. So along that high symmetry point, we want to find that electric field. So the first thing that I do is break up this radius, just like, sorry, break up the ring into a bunch of little point charges and see what that looks like. So I want the electric field here. So first find it here due to a point charge here. That's step one. Always start by breaking it up into small bits that you already know. In this case, the small bit that we already know is a point charge. And we can find the field here due to that. So first do that. And at this stage, it just boils down to drawing a really careful diagram. So we're going to draw a really careful diagram. And then we're going to translate the diagram into math really carefully. So I put the point, I'm thinking of a point charge here, a distance A from the origin. 
I want to find the field up here. My observation point is 0, 0, 0Z. And the point charge I've placed on the ring is a, a radius A away from the origin. Okay? And the way that I've set up the coordinates here, that's going to be minus A, comma 0, comma 0 is the position of that point charge. So that's, that's that. And I know that the electric field of a point charge is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, Q over R squared times R hat. That's the electric field here. And my job is then to just translate it into this diagram. So first off, I need to find the magnitude of R, and I need to find R hat. So the vector R, I need to read off the diagram. This is why I drew a really careful diagram, because now I can read the vector R off of it. The vector R points to me, right? So there's the point charge there. Our observation point is where we're standing. So imagine yourself standing at the observation point right up here. R hat points to me. So R hat points to the observation point. And it goes from the charge to the observation point. And that vector there, I can write as a comma 0 comma z. So here's a question for you. There's a negative a here in my diagram for where the point charge is sitting. But when I wrote down the vector r, I put a positive a there. Why did I do that? Yeah, because the vector itself is pointing to the right. So it's pointing along the x-axis. So it must have a positive a there. So positive a comma 0 comma z. Now we just translate from this into magnitude of r and r hat. Okay? So the magnitude of r is square root of a squared plus z squared. To get r hat, I take the vector r and divide by magnitude, which is a comma 0 comma z divided by a squared plus z squared to the 1 half. Okay, so next up, I just need to translate from these, uh, from these expressions that we got for r and for r hat into the electric field equation. So the electric field equation, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared times r hat. The 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught comes straight down. There's the q. And magnitude of r squared, if I think of magnitude of r squared, then that 1 half will become a 1. So what goes in the denominator here is a squared plus z squared. Then this whole bit here is r hat. And to get that, I'm just copying it down. R hat itself was a comma 0 comma z divided by a squared plus z squared to the 1 half. Any questions so far? Okay, I'm just going slowly and methodically to make sure that, uh, that I get the right answer. And here, to combine this denominator, I have a power of 1 here and a power of a half there. 1 plus a half gives me a 3 halves over there. So altogether, then, I have the electric field at this spot in space due to that point charge. Do you have any questions so far? OK, you ready to go on? Now we have to figure out how to sum this up. So we carefully got our expression, and we need to sum up all around the ring to get everything. So that's, that's our electric field there. Now, uh, now we're going to use some, some physics intuition, all right? So I have a ring, all right, ring of charge. And I'm going to stay on a high symmetry point. I'm going to stay on the axis of the ring, right? So if I'm on a high symmetry point, the axis of the ring, from, from the ring itself, I'll get a contribution to the electric field going this way. And then from another point of the ring, it'll be pointing in a different direction, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. So I need to sum up an electric field that's kind of pointing like a cone, right? I've got all those different electric field vectors coming from all the little point charges along the ring. Now, if I think just bit by bit, and I think about, well, there's a point charge here that contributes, and there's a point charge here that contributes, and they contribute electric fields pointing like this, then the sideways component cancels. And I just get the part along the z-axis. And that's going to happen all around the ring, right? When I sum up electric fields that are pointing like a cone, the net of that, the net vector of that, is just along the z-axis. Do you have any questions about that? OK. And, and you can either think of it as summing up a cone, or you can think piecewise, uh, pairwise from opposite sides of the ring. Okay. All right, so I'm only going to get the z component. Uh, when you make those kind of symmetry arguments, by the way, it saves you a lot of math, right? So I made the symmetry argument. Now I only need to calculate the z component, because we decided that that's the only thing that's going to survive. If you want to, you can carry out all the math for the entire thing, for the x component and the y component. And at the end of the day, you will also then prove mathematically that it goes to 0. So either way you like to do it is fine. I prefer this method because it gets me the answer in a slicker way. 
So the total electric field then is the sum around the ring, we'll figure out what sum around the ring means in a minute, but sum around the ring of all the little pieces of electric field contributing to that spot in space. Where delta E, I, now I need the, the E, sorry, the Z component of this piece. So I just read off of there the Z component of that piece. So if I read off of that, uh, I have the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Q now becomes delta Q because I'm thinking of a piece of a ring now. So the little q there becomes delta q over a squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. And I just plucked out the z components. There's a z there. OK, this a I don't care about because it was in the um, x direction. Questions so far? Now we need to figure out how to sum around a ring. OK, that's the next step. All right. OK, so next step, set up the integral. We're going to have some sort of summation of Q's all around the ring. And really, I don't want to work in Cartesian coordinates at that point, right? You always get to set up the problem however you like. If you need to choose a system, you get to choose which, what's in the system and what's not in the system. If there's a coordinate system in the problem, you always want to choose that so as to make your life easier. So in this case, I think the, the way to do this integral in the easiest way is not to work in the x, y, z coordinates because they have a circle. Now I want to sum up something all around a circle. And to sum up all around a circle, I really want an angle coordinate in there. So I'm going to switch to polar coordinates now in order to set up this, this integral. And I'm going to sum up all the charge around the circle by summing up an angle. So how do we set up that integral? We need that sum over the delta q's goes to some integral over an angle. I'm just going to remind you what we did for the infinite line charge first. So first, remember what we did before. This is from lecture five. And from lecture five, when we had a charge distribution distributed over a line, we broke up the line into little bits. The sizes were delta x, the charges were delta q. And then we showed how to go from the sum over delta q became big Q over big L, right? total charge over total length, times the sum over the little distances. So we essentially need this kind of thing again. We need to go from sum over the little q's to charge per unit length integral over some distance. Okay? And in our case, we're going all around a ring, so we're going to need to integrate over the distance of the ring itself. We'll integrate all the way around the entire circumference, basically. Do you have questions so far? Okay. So I still need to turn this into an integral over an angle. I want to get sum over the little delta q's goes to integrate d theta around this circle. So here's how I'll set it up. Here's the circle. The circle was lying in the xy plane. There's some angle I'm going to go around. I'll call that delta theta for now. And as I go around the angle delta theta, I trace out a length that I'll call delta L. And then when we go all the way around the entire circle, I better get the entire length of the circle, OK? So for a circle of radius A, what's the entire length around that circle? What's its circumference if the radius is A? 2 pi A. So I'm going to use the fact that that's 2 pi A 2 pi a to help me make sure I set up this integral correctly. So the ring of radius a has a total length, right, a circumference of L equals 2 pi a. The net charge q on the ring, we're going to uniformly distribute, OK, such that I have little delta q's. This little delta L has a delta q on it. And that's going to be uniformly distributed as total charge over total length times delta L. This is exactly what we had on uh, the previous slide where we had uh, the line charge. We had delta Q equals total Q over total L times delta L. Our L is 2 pi A. And now we need to figure out how to convert our delta L, our delta length, into this angle integral. Okay. So the circumference of a circle, like you already told me, is A times 2 pi. I'm going to think about this as, OK, whoa, went backwards. All right. Uh, as A as the radius times 2 pi. 2 pi is the angle if I go all the way around the circle, right? So 2 pi goes all the way around. So I should be able to then, by analogy, get the, ang get the, uh, the length. So let's say, OK, so I have a circle of radius A. I trace out 2 pi, and I go 2 pi A was the length that I just drew with my finger, right? But if I only go a certain angle, not the whole 2 pi, but if I go like, you know, pi over 2, it should just be proportional, right? So to get the length that my finger traces out, if I just go pi over 2, should be pi over 2 times A. Or if I just do a little teeny tiny angle, delta theta, then the length that my finger traces should be delta theta times A. So here's that. The little length that I trace out is A times delta theta for partway around the circle. 
And you can see that when I sum up the whole circle, I get the right answer. So just to double check that I get the right answer if I sum up the whole circle, the sum over the little delta L's calculated that way must go to A integral, uh, the sum over delta theta is now converts into an integral, integral from 0 to 2 pi d theta. Integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta is just 2 pi. So this becomes A times 2 pi, and I got the right answer. Okay? The reason I did that double check is to make sure I set up the integral correctly. Do you have any questions so far? I'm just making sure that I know how to take this summation. I need the summation of delta Q's converted into an integral over angles. So the delta Q we said was, all right, a big delta Q. From what we've done before, we know that that needs to be total charge divided by total length. Total charge here is Q. Total length is 2 pi A. And then the delta L, we said, needs to be A delta theta. So combining all that together, the A's cancel. And I get that big delta Q is Q over 2 pi delta theta. Okay? You, you might could also have gotten that a little quicker just by saying, look, I'm going to uniformly distribute the charge around the angle. Okay? So if the charge is distributed all over 2 pi, then the proportionality should just be the little angle chunk that I have. Okay? All right, so sum over all the delta Q's tends to Q over 2 pi, total charge over 2 pi, integral 0 to 2 pi d theta. Do you have any questions about that? Okay. Now we've got all the pieces we need. We've got the electric field. Uh, we've got the electric field at this point here due to a single piece of charge. And now we know how to sum up over the entire ring by summing over that angle. Okay. So the way that goes then is I take this, this uh, delta EZ, the little piece of uh, the contribution that this point charge makes to the Z component of the electric field there, and I'll just add it all up all over the ring. So it's 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Uh, the Z comes down. The 1 over A squared plus Z squared to the 3 halves comes down. The delta Q now I want to sum over. So this becomes sum over delta Q. And we decided that the way to sum over delta Q is to convert that into an integral. Total charge over 2 pi times integral 0 to 2 pi d theta. Okay, So that's all I'm doing here. I convert that sum over delta Q into Q over 2 pi, integral 0 to 2 pi d theta. Do you have any questions so far? OK. All right. So now I need to think about how to do the integral. All right. And be before I can go to integral lookup tables or Wolfram Alpha or, or ask my, math, my uh, math major friend how to do this integral, um, I need to think about what's constant or not. This is just an, ang uh, an integral over the angle. While I take this integration okay, over that ring, does the radius of the ring change? No, it's constant, right? My observation point is up here on the z-axis. I am going to sum over the ring. But as I do that, the, the, I'm not letting the radius of the ring change. That's fixed. It's given to me. So a is a constant. All right, how about z? z tells me my observation point. Am I going to let z change during this integration? No, nope. the observation point is where I'm standing, right? It, it, we're imagining that we're standing at the observation point. You don't want to move while you integrate. Okay? So you put yourself right here on the z-axis, and your z-component's not going to change as you integrate around. So none of this stuff inside there depends on theta. z doesn't depend on theta. a doesn't depend on theta. So I take it out. All right? So if I pull, pull all that stuff out, then uh, the z comes out. The 1 over a squared plus z squared to the 3 halves comes out. And I just have integral 0 to 2 pi of d theta. Okay? And I don't even need to look that up on Wolfram Alpha. Integrate 0 to 2 pi of d theta is just 2 pi. So this 2 pi here right, cancels that 2 pi. And altogether, I get 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Q comes down. There's the z. 1 over a squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. That's the field of a ring along the axis. And we know, of course, that that's pointing in the z hat direction. Do you have any questions about how that went? We just calculated the electric field along the z-axis. But I want you to think about it in the plane now. So here's that same ring of charge. And I want an observation point in the plane. OK? Is it on? I hear mumbling. Yeah, you guys are able to put answers in. OK, so which way does the field from this positively charged ring point at this <laughs> position x? So put your observation point in the same plane as the ring, outside the ring, and tell me which way it points. 
Okay, tell me, tell me a line of reasoning that gets me to an answer up here. What's, what's something we should consider? Or if you prefer, you can just tell me the answer. Yeah, right here. Okay, so I'll repeat this for the people who couldn't hear. So he's uh, thinking about the symmetry of the ring. And so we've put the, the ring in a plane, and I want you to tell me what it looks like on an observation point on the plane right here. And so thinking of the symmetry of the ring on the plane, <laughs> then the electric field must always point away from the ring if it's a positively charged ring. So if it's pointing away everywhere, and then I look at this high symmetry point, it's got to be pointing away, <laughs> is what you're saying, OK? And so the way to point away right here is to the left. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Could you have any questions about that? Are there other things we should take into account? OK, you good? All right. All right. All right, good. Way to use symmetry, OK? So you could then do our calculation in that, that plane as well. Would, would, um, you'd get a different answer, but the plane is another high symmetry point where you could use symmetry to make your calculation a little simpler. All right, so now we're going to move on. We did the ring. Now we're ready to do a disk. We're going to do an entire disk now of charge. And I have a disk now of radius big R. Okay, So the radius of the ring was A. But now I'm going to think of a lot of radiuses of ring A. Small, small, big, 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 medium, medium, and so forth, OK? Building up to the big radius, big R. So this is full of rings now. And I want to find the electric field here along the z axis. Now, I'm going to uniformly distribute charge all over the disk of radius R. Answer me this, though. If I tell you that I've uniformly distributed charge all throughout that disk, is this disk made of an insulator or out of a conductor? OK, all right. I hear, I, hear, I hear the insulator answer being very confidently said. OK, what tells you that it's an insulator rather than a conductor? Yeah. OK, all right, so if it were a conductor, the charges can move around. I'll just repeat it for the back to here. If this were a conductor and I put uniform charge on it, the, and let's just say that we put positive charge on. I always like to think in terms of positive charge first. So I put positive charge on. They can move. They run as far away as they can from each other. They go to the surface of the conductor. And so they'd mostly end up on the outside here. Okay? And if I had um, a little bit of maybe thickness to the disk, you know, I'd probably get some charge on the top and bottom layers as well. But most of the charge is going to run out to the, to the very edge. So if I tell you that it's uniformly distributed, think of an insulator. Okay? So the charge is uniformly distributed uh, inside. We'll do the exact same procedure as before, but now we have to calculate um, a different area. So first find the electric field here on this spot due to this point charge here. That's step one again. Right? And we did this before, right? We just did this a few slides ago, where we put a point charge here uh, on the x-axis and calculated the electric field up here at the observation point 0, 0, 0z due to a point charge at minus a, 0, 0. Okay? So that's always step one, is set that up first. We did this all before. It's exactly what it was. Does that look familiar? OK, so we, all, we just did all that. And we'll just take the result. OK, so we'll just take the result from that <clears throat> and say that this is what the electric field is there. Now the work is to integrate. Now we need to integrate um, a point charge now all over the surface of the disk. <clears throat> so how do we set up this integral? Last time, we just had charge on the ring. So we did an integral by saying, look, we should be working in polar coordinates. It's the easier thing to calculate in this case due to the symmetry of the problem. And we calculate it all around the ring. Now I need to calculate around the edge of the ring. And then I need it for a smaller radius as well. And then for a smaller radius and a smaller radius. And I can't make my arm shrink. But you get the idea. I'm going to calculate around circles and then I'll integrate over all those circles on the inside as well. So I need to figure out how to do that. I am going to, and there's a few ways you could go with this, OK? So there's a few different ways to go. I'm going to calculate it directly as an area, OK? So I'm going to say that I need to learn how to calculate the area of a circle using calculus, all right? Without using calculus, what's the area of a circle of radius r? Pi r squared, OK? So if we can figure out the calculus way to get that area, that'll help us integrate this charge. That's what we need to do. So I have a net charge, a total charge on the entire disk of big Q. I have a net area on the total disk of big area pi r squared. Okay? And anywhere I look inside the disk, if I take a little chunk of the disk, it's going to have a particular charge on it. And it's going to have a particular area on it. 
But charge divided by area on that little bit has to equal this charge divided, the big charge divided by big area, right? Big charge divided by big area is little charge divided by little area anywhere I look. Does that make sense? That the charge, basically the charge per unit area is the charge per unit area, whether I'm looking at the whole disk or little pieces of the disk. So how much charge is in this little bitty area element here? The area element here will have a little piece of charge, delta Q. Now I need to figure out how to write that area element down. All right, so I'm thinking of a piece of a circle that I'm going to integrate up using calculus to get the circle again. There's this length that we already calculated, the little piece of length along the radius, right? We said was the radius of the circle A times a little piece delta theta. That gives me that length that my finger traces out. That's right here, AD theta. Now for this spot here, I'm going to let the coordinate A, the radius, now change. And so this little length here is going to be DA. And I'm going to approximate the area of that little piece as just length times width, which is going to be DA times AD theta. And in the limit that those little boxes get small, calculus works, and I'll get the right areas. So the area element is DA times AD theta. That's right here. Do you have any questions about setting that part up? That's probably the trickiest bit, is writing down that area element. Yeah, question. How do I set it up? Oh, so uh, we have this part already. Is this part OK, the AD theta? OK. Now to get the, this part here, the DA, is as I change the radius of the circle that I'm considering, that's the coordinate that'll change, is the radius. And here I'm, just, I'm using A to describe the radius. But it's not quite good enough. I do need to prove to you that it's going to give the right answer. So I'll do, I'll do that too. We'll just double check and make sure that it really gives us the, the area. So the net charge, again, thinking in terms of total charge is to total area as piece of charge is to piece of area. Okay? Then think of the total charge being the sum over all those little delta Qs. Here's the total charge again divided by total area. And here's the total area again. So total charge equals total charge divided by total area equals total area. Now let me show you that this guy actually works, right? That's, that's the crux of this. So to get the integral here, I summed over A delta theta times delta A and turned them into integrals. So this A delta theta right, goes, goes here, integral A delta theta or integral AD theta, and this d delta A turns into integral DA, <laughs> where um, I'm using the convention that whatever comes to the right needs to be integrated over. So when you see this A in here, this DA is going to integrate that A. Is that, are you OK with A as an integration variable? OK? All right. Now, let's just make sure this is going to give me the right answer. So there we go. So I need to show you that that integral actually works. So to get the area of a circle, we're thinking that that integral right there, integral dA, integral a d theta, must work out. Okay. So I'm going to rearrange the integral a little bit. So a and theta are independent coordinates, so I can gather them together, right? So I'm going to gather one of the integrals is going to be the integral d theta times the other integral is integral of a dA, okay? So I'm thinking about a circle. What are the limits on d theta? Theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. And again, I'm thinking of a circle of, let's do a circle of radius big R. So what are the limits on integration here for dA? 0 to R, okay? Integral d theta, uh, even I can do that without looking it up on Wolfram Alpha. This guy is just 2 pi. This guy, integral a dA, is a squared over 2 from 0 to r, which equals r squared over 2. And now if I, add, if I multiply these guys together, the 2 pi times the r squared over 2, I get all together pi r squared, and I got the area correctly. Smiley face is the new QED, OK? All right, we're good? That should answer your question. And that's the calculation I had to do to make sure I set it up correctly. Yeah, question here. Oh, okay. So I'm approximating that the if <coughs> length times width. I realize that this little box here is not quite a square. I'm pretending that it's a square. And so I, to get that little area element here, I said length times width. And in the limit, right, this is the beauty of calculus, in the limit that I take those little pieces very small, they become squares. 
and then it's okay. Does that help? Good, good question. Other questions? Okay, all right, so now we know how to set this up. The point of this slide was to convince you that the, the way to do this is to say that sum over the delta Q's is total charge over total area times integral d theta a dA. Now, the next thing we need to do is just integrate over that whole disk. So we already have that by symmetry, only the z component will survive, okay? We actually used that before when we did the ring, right? When we did the ring, we said that for an observation point on the z axis, it'll get contributions from all directions from the ring. So that's kind of like integrating a conical shaped a bunch of electric fields, right, in, in the shape of a cone, and then they all add together to give me just a z component. <laughs> Same thing will happen here if I think piece by piece of the disk being made of a, of a bunch of rings, right? For a disk, which I can think of as made up of a bunch of rings, it must be as well that the net electric field along the z-axis <coughs> points only along the z-axis, right? Or another way to convince yourself of that is, you know, think of a big, you know, think of a big plate, right? And I'm going to go some distance away from it. I can't have an electric field pointing to the right or left because there is no distinction, right, in this problem. Questions so far? Are you okay that it's just the z component? Okay? All right, so that's important because it saves us a lot of work, then we only need to calculate the z component of the electric field. So the total electric field then will be, just as it was before, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, sum over delta Q, z over a squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. The key that's going to be different now, right, this looks exactly like what we did with the ring, the key that's going to be different now, right, looks familiar, I hope, is that when I do the, the sum over delta Q, is going to now take me all over the entire disk, right? Before we did it just for the ring, now our sum over Q's is big Q over pi r squared, integral d, dA, integral A d theta. So there, there it is. I turn the, the sum over delta Q into this integral. I need the Q over pi r squared times integral dA, integral A d theta. And now I need to stare at stuff. Before I go putting it into Wolfram Alpha to see what the integral is, I need to make sure that I, if there's something inside that integral that's constant, I need to pull it out, okay? So that I, I know it's not going to affect the, the integral. So thinking about here, tell me what's constant in there. I have <coughs> z and a running around, and I'm going to integrate over a and theta. So how, oh, there it already popped out at you. <laughs> um, the, the theta, right? A doesn't depend on theta. They're independent coordinates, right? A is the radius and theta is the <coughs> distance around, sorry, the angle around, so that's independent, all right? What about z? Does, does z change as I change the theta? Okay. Does z, my observation point, change as I change which disk, uh, well, the, the, the radius A? Doesn't change. So those are, those are constant. Right? And in fact, there's nothing in here that depends on theta. So I can pull the integral d theta all the way through everything, and I just get an integral d theta here. The a's, though, I haven't, even though z is a constant in this problem, and I can pull the z all the way out, and there's a z down here, I can't pull that out, right? Because it's got an a next to it. So there's an a squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. I can't pull that out because there's an a, and I need to integrate over a. But tell me the limits of integration. What's the limits of integration on theta? Z to 2 pi, what's the limits of integration on A looking at this diagram? So I have radiuses, little, little A's that I'm going to integrate over. From the smallest radius is 0, and then the biggest radius is big R. So that tells me what limits I should have there. Okay, so you told me 0 to 2 pi and 0 to R. Integral 0 to 2 pi d theta is 2 pi, so that'll cancel a factor of 2 pi here which gives me a 1 over epsilon naught. There's the Q over pi r squared. There's um, this whole guy right here is a complicated integral that I look up on Wolfram Alpha, and then I find the answer to that. Okay, multiply through by the z, and altogether this guy becomes 1 minus z over square root of r squared plus z squared, and it's all in the z hat direction. Okay, and going from this step to this step is to look up the answer to that integral, or ask your math major friend. Or if you are a math major yourself, then I presume you prove it to yourself. Okay. All right. Questions so far? That was a lot of math, okay? All right. So I should tell you that 
we don't expect you to be able to, on a test, reproduce all these steps, okay? What I'm showing you is uh, a philosophy about how to calculate it. If I needed you to do this kind of calculation, I would give you very small steps and walk you through bit by bit by bit by bit by bit. So what we've done is gone through a very long chain of logic. It's very much like, has anybody been rock climbing? Maybe gone rock climbing? Okay, yeah, when you're going rock climbing, you better be sure that, I hope they use the supports, okay? So, you know, use a belay when you rock climb, and you need to make sure that it's hooked up properly to the top of where you're going, and that the chain is very, very secure and securely hooked to you. So basically, this line of logic is like that chain, okay? And we prove that the chain is correct, and now you can just use it. So now you can just use this field of, uh, the electric field of a, of a, uh, a disk along its axis. Okay, but the philosophy is something I want you to be aware of. That the way we got it was we just took the electric field due to all those pieces and then added them up. So you should know the principle, the idea behind it, and then now that you know the idea behind it, you can just use this formula. Okay, questions? And on tests, of course, I give you an equation sheet. I don't expect you to memorize that formula. I want you to know the physics of it and know how to use the formula. Questions so far? Got it? Okay. Now we're ready to do the infinite plane. We said we were going to build up the infinite plane. We started with a ring. After we did the ring, we did the disk. Now that I have a disk, I can take the size of the disk out to infinity, and that will give me the answer for an <coughs> infinite plane. So that's how we're going to build this up. We already know the electric field of a disk along the z-axis. So here's the disk. Here was our observation point along the z-axis. And now I'm going to let that disk go to infinity. That is uh, the radius of the disk become infinite. So I'll let the radius r go to infinity. As I do that, okay, if I just had a certain amount of charge on there, and then I distributed that finite charge over an infinite disk, then I lose the effect, right? So I need to, as the radius of the disk goes to infinity, I need to let the charge on the disk go to infinity as well, in such a way that charge per unit area stays a constant. So r goes to infinity, q goes to infinity, but the ratio q over pi r squared needs to remain constant as I do that. So that means anywhere I look on this, this infinite plane, if I take a chunk out of it, there's a particular charge per area. And I could go to some other part on the plane and take a chunk out of it, and it's got the same charge per area on it. Okay? Questions about how you do that limit? All right. So now, now we do some math. Take the limit, in this case, of r goes to infinity while q over r squared is a constant. And this part here just becomes sigma, so q over pi r squared becomes sigma because of how we set up the limit in a physical way. And then this part here, I have a radius that's going to go to infinity. Now, z could be anything, right? z is my distance from the plane. So z is the distance from the plane. But you could be as far away as you want from the plane, you know, a million meters, a kilometer, whatever. And infinity is still way bigger than that, right? So no matter what z you choose as your observation distance, r is still infinitely larger. And so I have a 1 over infinity in here, dragging this term to 0. So altogether, then, the net electric field is 1 over 2 epsilon naught. This q over pi r squared became sigma. And this whole term became 1. So that's it. It gets very simple. The field of an infinite plane is just sigma over 2 epsilon naught, where sigma is charge per unit area. And then you got to go back and do the physics to remember that if it's a positively charged plane, field points away. You have a question? Yes. Um, since it's an infinite, since we're looking at an infinite disk, can we also assume that since we can't measure the infinite disk, that an infinite square would work the same way? Oh, OK, OK. He's asking the question of, we did this infinite plane limit by calculating a disk and letting the disk go to infinity. Could we have done it for a square? and taking the size of the square to infinity? Absolutely. You'd get the same answer. You have to get the same answer. Yeah, good question. Other questions so far? All right, this is nice and simple, right? This was kind of a complicated equation. But when you take it to the infinite plane limit, it's a very nice, simple equation. OK, now that we have one infinite plane, we're not going to stop there, right? One infinite plane has an electric field of sigma over 2 epsilon naught. Actually, before we go adding two planes to the problem, Let's just think a little bit more about this infinite plane, because it's a bit weird. This says that no matter where I am, no matter what distance I am from this infinite plane, I measure the same electric field. It's always sigma over 2 epsilon naught. I could be nose to nose with the plane, 
and I'd measure E is sigma over 2 epsilon naught. I could be a million miles away from that infinite plane, and I'd still measure that electric field is sigma over 2 epsilon naught. Okay? Is that weird? Do you think that's right? Do you have questions about how it's weird? I think it's weird. <laughs> okay? All right. So remember what was happening with the point charge. With the point charge, it had an electric field that falls off like 1 over r squared. And that's because coming off of the point charge are all these electric field lines going in every direction. And they have to go every direction, so they splay out. And the fact that the electric field lines splay out means that as you move away, the total field is weaker and weaker. Okay? For the rod, the infinite rod, the field coming off the rod has to splay out in every direction. So you get electric field lines splaying out, and because they're splaying out, the total field gets weaker and weaker as you get away. But now think of the infinite plane. So I have an infinite plane of charge, okay? Infinite plane of charge, and coming off the infinite plane of charge are electric field lines that just go straight. They don't splay. Which way would they turn, right? They're, you know, it's an infinite plane. It doesn't know up or down, right or left. So the electric field just comes straight out, never splays, so it never decreases in magnitude. It's just what it is. Do you have questions about that? Yeah. What is the application of this? Oh. Brilliant question. OK, we're going to get to that. But first, I have to add two planes, and then we'll see what the application will be. OK? So the question was, let's use this for something. OK, good. We're going we're to use it for something. All right, so let's put two infinite planes together, positive charge on one, negative charge on the other. This positive charge has an electric field coming away from it. This negative charged plane has an electric field coming towards it. And I want to put them parallel to each other in space and see what the net electric field is everywhere. So I use superposition. I just write down all the electric field vectors for both of them. Here's the positively charged plane. And it has the red electric field vectors coming away on this side, away on this side. And even way over here, there's the same magnitude of electric field coming off that red positively charged plane. The green plane has an electric field pointing towards it everywhere in space. So over here, there's an electric field pointing towards it. Over here, there's an electric field pointing towards it. Even way over here, there's an electric field pointing towards that green plane. Okay? So now let's think piecewise. In this region right here, if these two planes have the same charge per unit area, then these red and green field lines are going like this. So what's the net electric field to the, to the left over here? If the field lines are going like this, it's zero. They actually exactly cancel and give me zero. How about over here, to the right? Same thing, right? The electric field lines are, are equal and opposite, so they cancel out. In the middle here, they don't cancel. They're pointing in the same direction. Okay, So now I have them both pointing that way. So they'll add directly. And in the middle there, I add up sigma over 2 epsilon naught to sigma over 2 epsilon naught, and I get sigma over epsilon naught. So here's the total field configuration of two infinite Parallel planes where one is positively charged and the other is negatively charged. Yeah, question here. OK, yeah, uh, this is exactly how we should think. We just got this answer. We should question it physically. So we should do the physical intuition. And you're saying, look, if I'm over here, I'm closer to the green plane than to the red plane. Surely the green plane has a larger effect than the red plane. If they're really infinite planes, that's not the case. If they're finite disks, that will absolutely be the case. But if they're really infinite planes, uh, then this electric field just doesn't die out. So the electric field from the red plane just keeps marching on and marching on and marching on. It is what it is. It's, yes, it's weird. That's why it's worth asking these questions of really, really. And it has to do, again, with as the electric field comes off the red plane, its field lines just go straight parallel out. And they're not splaying or, and getting weaker. They're just continuing marching on. So it really is zero. So it means that if I had these two infinite planes in the next room, we wouldn't have a way to detect it. Okay? So it could, could be. We just wouldn't, wouldn't be able to measure it until we walked over there, knocked on it, and punched a hole in it and measured inside. But from the outside, you cannot tell. It is wiggy. Okay? All right. So, sorry. The application is a capacitor. Okay? So if I go now to the finite disk case, Okay, the application of this would be not the infinite planes, but two parallel plates, all right, 
And if the parallel plates, if, if the radius of the plate is a certain amount, and I put those, those disks very close to each other compared to the radius, then inside it's going to look just like this. Big field inside, and actually it'll be a very weak field outside. If those, the closer those planes get together, the weaker that field will be outside. There is a little bit of one. We call that the fringe field of a capacitor. So there's your application. Excellent question. All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday.